Yeah, you can invite Dr. Pandav now. Yeah, yes, sir. Uh, yes, Dr. Taruch. It's my privilege actually to invite and introduce Dr. S.S. Pandav, who is uh, the immediate past president of Glaucoma Society of India. And he currently heads the advanced uh, eye center of postgraduate Institute of Medical Education and Research at Chandigarh. And uh, he's a, again a voracious and very versatile researcher and a wonderful surgeon. So over to you, sir, Dr. Pandav, sir. Thank you, Manavdi. And uh, uh, I, I got connected just in time, actually. I have been struggling with the connection, but luckily uh, I'm online now. So I'm going to share my screen. Okay. Uh, can you uh, see my screen? Yes, yes sir. Nice okay. to so thank you, uh, Tanuj, and thank you, APGS and I, AIUS for uh, including me into the program. So I'll be talking about the hypotonic maculopathy. There's no, uh, nothing to declare. So hypotonic maculopathy after trivialectomy is actually uh, quite common, uh, but the problem happens when it persists. So persistent hypotony, which is kind of defined as IOP less than six millimeters of mercury and lasting for 12 weeks. So transient hypotony is very common and usually uh, it's not a big issue, it, you know, uh, it, it recovers, but once uh, it becomes chronic or uh, you know, uh, persistent, then there could be a uh, problem with uh, and can lead to a decrease in visual function. There are many reasons for persistent hypotony, blood leaks, overfiltration, cyclodialysis, and many others actually. But in this talk, we are basically talking about the uh, the overfiltration following cataract surgery, which actually is the one which is difficult to uh, manage. Uh, and the maculopathy happens uh, when there's a long-standing uh, hypotony and uh, the, the loss of central vision, it, you know, clinically it presents like a loss of central vision and some distortions. And you will see the choroidal and retinal folds, there would be discadema, the vascular tortuosity, and there may be a subtle uh, macroedema which can be missed clinically, but if you do uh, you know, the OCT, you'll find that there may be a macular edema in many of these cases. Uh, the decreased vision is due to uh, macular changes, uh, which are generally temporary uh, because of the miss kind of a change in the orientation of photoreceptors and some degree of uh, edema in that area. But if the if the condition is not resolved uh, early, then these changes may become permanent and there could be a uh, permanent uh, decrease in visual equity. And of course, uh, hypotony can lead to cataract formation and some other complication, which could cause uh, be the cause of decrease in vision. The risk factors for hypotony are uh, young age, male gender, myopia, uh, use of mitomycin C, that's I think very important here. And also if the ciliary body is already compromised and if you do splitting surgery sometimes, uh, you know, it could lead to excessive uh, uh, lowering of intraocular pressure. So typically a male myopic patient where you have used uh, a young male myopic patient with the mitomycin C, that's a kind of typical setting for hypertension to happen. And one of these studies by Penning uh, and all uh, and others, uh, they found that diabetes and choroidal detachment are actually kind of protective for, in, in the sense that if you have diabetes and if there's a choroidal detachment, uh, somehow it doesn't happen. Um, so as I said, uh, the hypotony is quite common, and, but uh, if, if you look at the hypotonic maculopathy, the, the incidence reported varies uh, greatly from 1.3% to almost 20%. Uh, and it's a, it has also been seen that the primary surgery has a higher risk of hypertony than the repeat or combined procedures. And uh, also the, the, the sclera, uh, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the reverse of hypertony, to reverse the hypertony, uh, it's possible to reverse the hypertony. And uh, once you have reversed it, uh, the visual recovery is quite uh, good and uh, say up to 90% of the cases, they will have a good recovery. But again, there's just some percentage of cases where recovery uh, will not be complete. So managing reversal for hypotony is, uh, and the maculopathy is important. And the patients without maculopathy, and if there's no de decrease in visual equity, then these patients can safely be observed. Because hypotony basically, there's a stat stat statistical hypotony, and also you have what is a clinically significant hypotony. So what I said, uh, IOP of less than six millimeters mercury, basically you're talking uh, of the statistical hypotony, uh, but sometimes patients may not have uh, any visual symptoms, even at six millimeters of mercury pressure. So they are, uh, the, uh, you know, the maculopathy doesn't happen. So 
so so you, so you have to look at the patient from that angle as well because sometimes myoclopathy may occur at you know 6.5 or 7 millimeters of mercury IOP as well. So I think that would be considered as a hypotony, clinically significant hypotony in those situations. Uh, reversal of hypotony is important, uh, and this is also quite challenging. Uh, many procedure techniques have been described in literature, you know, which varies from cryotherapy of the blood to laser application uh, to the area, injection of autologous blood, uh, blood compression sutures, resuching the scleral flap, and uh, you know, a few some more. So this is a case of 38 years old male, which we have done bilateral uh, juvenile open angle glaucoma. And the uh, right eye had already undergone surgery with eight millimeters of mercury pressure. The left eye is 30 millimeters of mercury pressure. And this is the uh, fundus picture of the left eye and uh, visual equity is 612 in both eyes. So he underwent trabeculectomy in the left eye with mitomycin C. And uh, in the post-operative period, the IOP was low on day one, day one week. Uh, two weeks, some, you know, increase in uh, IOP, but subsequently it went back again to two to three. So even at three months, the pressure was just two millimeters of mercury, and there was a decrease in uh, visual equity as vision had gone down to 360 by this time. So we do, and you can see the blood is actually very diffuse here. This, uh, uh, this picture has been taken the OR before the repair of this. So it you know, looks a little congested, but it's a, it was like a, a vascular, a large nephritic blev, and you can see there's a, the macular folds are there, and OCT actually has some, uh, some fluid also uh, in, the, in the macular area, and that may be the reason for decrease in vision. So what we did in the case was that we'd use a combined technique for compression suture and the, uh, and, and the square dissection and fixing. So what we did, we went behind the, uh, uh, the the blab and you know dissected the conjunctiva and the tendon capsule and identified the scleral flap there, which we thought was over filtering on this area as well as on the other side, but more in this area. So that's the previously applied suture at the apex, and we uh, we put another suture, uh, you know, uh, at a place where the scleral uh, the, the you know the the, the partial thickness scleral flap was actually uh, you know open. And then we close this small incision. So this is done through a small incision. And uh, because the other side, we don't want to suture it for because it could have led to high pressure. So we uh, played a little safe in the sense that we put a compression suture on the other side so that uh, if, we, if the pressure goes up, we have an option of uh, you know, removing this compression suture. And also compression sutures with time, you know, they become a little loose and uh, the, the IOP may drop again. So basically, we in this patient we used a double technique of you know, suturing the scleral flap directly as well as a compression suture. And subsequently, as you can see, the pressure. Uh, this was uh, about eight months after the, the repair procedure. We can see the pressure is staying very well around ten millimeters of mercury, but the vision that could actually didn't improve uh, didn't uh, uh, improve to the baseline. And we are at a 618, and you can see there's some changes in the macro area uh, there. Uh, and in the on this picture also, we can see those stries. Which are some the, the pigmentary changes uh, are still uh, visible. So probably uh, uh, because of these pigmentary changes that happened, the retinal pigment epithelium. Uh, so the uh, visual equity uh, is down, and also these, uh, there may be some you know evidence of some membrane formation there. So. That might be the reason that his visual equity still remains low. But I think that the grossly there's a reversal of the hypotonic uh, hypotony as well as the fundus uh, changes that they were there earlier seen in this patient. This is another patient where we had a, uh, we, we could see the, the skull uh, edge was actually over filtering on this side. So here we used a direct transconjunctival switch in the skull flap. Now this has been described by the Tartre and, and others, and uh, in their data, in a small, uh, see the small uh, number of cases actually, um, they said this about 90, more than 90% of uh, cases they succeed. Now this suture was, suturing was done trans uh, the time, uh, this will get internalized, internalized and it will not be visible on the surface. Uh, and uh, so this again, a very uh, a good technique to deal with the uh, hypotonic. The resuturing of the flap after opening the type up uh, posteriorly has been shown to be effective to the tune of 89 to 90%, uh, and that's been published, I think, many years ago. 
uh, and also the compression switches, uh, the success rate again, you know, many, there, uh, you know, uh, the many studies on kind of data is available on this and 60 to 70 percent success rate is kind of is what is uh, reported in literature. So what we did was we used a combination of these procedures. We combined uh, stir flap suturing and uh, compression suture uh, reversal, uh, and that reversed the hypotonic maculopathy in our patient, and also improved the vision. Though it was not a complete recovery, but uh, we did get some uh, improvement. Uh, this is another patient with IOP is less than six millimeters of mercury for more than twelve weeks. Uh, this is again a young patient, young male myopic patient with trap uh, with MMC. Actually, he underwent uh, surgery in both eyes, the right eye was first, which gave us a good uh, IOP of 13 millimeters of mercury. And you can see that there's a good blab, which is a bit localized as well, but I think it's filtering nicely. However, the left eye didn't behave in the same manner. You can see a very diffuse blab there, and the pressure is uh, you know less than 6 millimeters of mercury in most of the uh, follow visits. So here, here we use a little different technique. What we did was that we delimited this blab. So this is the blab. So what we did was we made a conjunctival incision here vertically, the linear incision, radial incision actually, uh, to the one side of the blab. And uh, we put uh, interrupted so, uh, uh, A0 vicar sutures. And these sutures, when we took the sutures, we included the conjunctiva tenon as well as a little bit of bite of the epistolar tissue so that you know, the, it, it was stuck to the, uh, to the, the sclera, so that there was kind of barrier was created. And you can see this is about three weeks post-operatively. And uh, you can see actually not only in this area, the blev is getting like a delimited, but also you can see there's a, even in the area which has not been uh, dealt with, there is some vascularization is happening in that area as well. And this is how it was seen, you know, 15 weeks uh, down the line. So the area, this is where uh, the delimitation was done, but I think even subsequent, the rest of the blev is actually uh, walled off. So I think the, once you, the fibrosis is stimulated in this area, I, I think the fibrosis also occurs in other areas as well. So, uh, so I think this is another technique which can be used to deal with these cases because there is no uh, one way to deal with these, uh, uh, with these patients. So to summarize, hypertony is common after glaucoma operating surgery. Persistent hypertony can lead to decrease in uh, vision. Uh, reversal of hypertony is difficult, but can be achieved in, you know, in most of the cases. Uh, a number of procedures have been described, and the procedure we choose actually depends on uh, what is the underlying cause. If there's underlying cause for hypertony, that has to be dealt with as a leakage or you know, the, the blood needs to be excised, or, you know, so that can be done. But in the absence of that, uh, uh, again, uh, different procedures have been prescribed. Uh, we, didn't, we didn't have a good uh, experience with the injection of the autologous blood, blood so we don't uh, prefer that. But uh, I think uh, uh, direct closure of the sclera flap and also in a compression suture, they work uh, better in uh, my hands at least. Uh, so the careful planning is actually required so that intervention can be planned. And once the hypertony is reversed, there is a usual improvement in vision unless it's delayed too much. In that case, uh, you, you know, uh, what literature suggests is that maybe about 20% cases may not actually uh, uh, get back to the baseline vision where we started. Uh, thank you very much once again for the opportunity. And thank you all. Uh, thank you.